Yeah, Energy Justice in Hawaii here at four o'clock clock on ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're co-hosting today. Uh, me and Ali Andrews. Hi, Ali. Hi, Jay. So I want to uh, I want to talk today about uh, weather and to the extent uh, is Hawaii resilient to extreme weather here on Energy Justice because uh, we know that if we don't have resilience, certain certain parts of our you know demographic are going to be affected more than others. And you know, usually, as usual, it's the people you know who are disadvantaged who are affected worse. Um, so there's no justice in not being resilient. It, it just you know it's just Aristotelian. So the question uh, you know is raised by what happened in Texas a few months ago um, with their you know failure to be resilient against a cold snap. I guess it was a really bad cold snap. Uh, and what happened in um, in less less uh, rather uh, New Orleans just just a couple of weeks ago, which is um, you know much scarier in the sense that in in New Orleans uh, they had the opportunity to put their power lines underground, and they didn't do anything about it. The government didn't do anything about it. And then when the, when the storm came, the uh, the towers blew over, the poles blew over, and I think most of New Orleans and Environ are still now today without power. And, and that means the people who are disadvantaged are without power because the other guys left town already. Um, if you have a few bucks, you leave town. Um, so it's, it's really a problem uh, if you're not resilient. The other thing is, uh, I don't want to tell you anything you don't know, Ali, but we are in climate change and it is getting worse all the time. That's probably why you care so much about energy and energy justice. Um, and although the, the media doesn't necessarily associate these extreme weather situations and wildfires uh, with climate change, they're, they're definitely part of climate change. They're caused by climate change. Give me a break. We should all know that and live that all day long. And Congress should know that, but unfortunately it doesn't know that. So the, the problem is that you know climate change, extreme weather can affect and, and we see wildfires too, and drought and flood, all those things are all part of climate change increasingly. And the, the, you know, the connection is so obvious. One of these days, Oahu, the most populated island is gonna get a storm. We've been so lucky and it's gonna get a storm and we have a, a lot of over, over ground electrical connectivity and towers and telephone poles and all this. It's coming. I wake up in the morning, I say to myself today, what a beautiful day it is. One day closer to the next extreme storm, which will be worse than any storm you can imagine. So that's the problem. And the question before the house is, are we resilient to that storm? And if we are not, what is gonna to happen to our you know, energy systems? And what is gonna to happen to the people who are disadvantaged, those who would be affected more than others by the failure of our energy systems. It really counts. Uh, when, when there was that storm, uh, was it Maria in Puerto Rico, maybe four or five years ago, um, there was a huge field of solar array, okay? And one half the field, we know this because we had a show about it. One half the field had a certain kind of fastener holding down the, um, you know, the, 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 the anchors and, and the solar cells. And the other side of the field, about half divided, uh, had a different kind of fastener. And when the wind came from Maria and blew through that field, the field with one kind of fastener, it just got, you know, destroyed. All the solar rays, all the anchors, all finished, gone. The other side held. So the point is, it really makes a difference if you plan ahead. If you look at those fasteners, if you if you make things resilient. Now I know you're an energy buff to the max, and I want to know your thoughts about this. Okay, how resilient are we? Wow, just coming right out there with the big question right away. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on. Think Tech having you on your again. show. On yeah. your show, I know. Well. Uh, um, I'm still grateful to be here either way, and I, I think this topic is really interesting. I don't, um, 
I will admit that I'm not a huge expert in resiliency in general, but you are correct that I am an energy nerd and like to think about this a lot, particularly that question that you posed around uh, what happens to our frontline communities, our most vulnerable communities, which we know from uh, the events, the ice storm in Texas uh, this winter and, and the current outages that are happening in New Orleans that our, our low-income communities, our communities of color, um, statistically are, are the ones who are left without power for longer um, or experience those uh, more extreme um, uh, impacts because of losing power, because of lack of access, as you said. Um, I would say in, without, you know, without being a resiliency expert, um, I think that uh, renewables in general make us resilient to those events that would uh, isolate us from external um, resources for longer. Um, if we are dependent upon fossil fuels coming to our islands, um, those uh, do not come from here. Those come from very far away. So if the, if the ports or, or the way that we receive those fuels cannot enter, then we have um, a finite resource. I'm sure that we have a, a pretty large backup, um, but uh, the sun comes every day, um, uh, the wind comes every day. Uh, so I think in general, renewables and battery storage are looked to as being more resilient. So as Hawaii does the good job of shifting to, towards uh, renewable energy, I believe that makes us more resilient. And I think that there are also ways of deploying those uh, renewables in ways that make us more resilient, in ways that distribute the energy um, uh, rather than centralize it. Uh, there is a big movement around uh, distributed energy as providing more resilience. The closer it is to where we use it, the less dependent we are upon the infrastructure that has to take it to us, aka the the distribution lines and the transmission lines uh, in some parts of the island. So if we have a failure in those uh, channels, in those uh, distribution and transmission lines, uh, distributed energy is better. And, and I think that's a huge buzz. Why we hear so much about microgrids these days is the ability for microgrids to, um, uh, to provide that safety, that isolation, that backup um, in a severe case. Um, I think for me, one of the big questions is uh, those systems uh, historically have cost more. And so microgrids, as, as awesome as they are, and as, as much as I love to hear about their buzz and the new technologies that enable them, they still do microgrids cost more than, than uh, not having that islanded backup um. Ability. I think that I think that uh, should be on the final exam, Molly. Uh, <laughs> the question on the final exam would be, um, um, you know, does resilience cost more? And the answer mm. is yes. What okay. would you rather have? A blackout like like in New Orleans that lasts for days, weeks, months, maybe more, um, mm -hmm. or would you like to have your power back? You know, and people don't realize that what what happens. Wake up in the morning nothing works in your house um you want to watch the tube no tube you want to do internet no internet no nothing mm -hmm. um what's that worth anyway there's a question it's funny that you should raise that because there's a question i want to read it to you uh from a viewer a viewer question we appreciate all viewer questions <clears throat> question what is the value of resilience i guess that means the value economically and what is the cost of resilience who pays who should pay for the cost mm -hmm. of resilience and this is something you, you you covered tangentially does having solar panels on your roof make you more resilient okay that's a compound multiple question but let's, let's see what you can do with it ali <laughs> uh i will start with the uh last one first I think um, in general, having solar panels on your roof does not surprisingly um, ensure that you will have power in the case of a power outage. In fact, most rooftop installations are connected to the grid in a way that the utility has the ability to shut it off 
as soon as uh, there's an outage on the line in general. And there's a safety reason for that um, because if they're sending out uh, individuals, uh, line people um, uh, to service the lines and you, they think that the power is out on this circuit, but your solar um, system is sending power on the grid, that can be a very dangerous situation. Um, and so- I'd suggest um, that, that I'm better off if I'm, uh, if I'm free of the grid. Uh, thank you, but I don't want to be connected kind of thing. Now, a lot of people wouldn't do that because they want the backup from, from the utility. But if you did do that and you weren't connected, this problem would not exist, right? Uh, that is that is likely true, unless the storm, you know, ripped off your solar panels or uh, ruined your circuitry, uh, you probably would be better off in a hardy off-grid system. Um, I would say that there are ways uh, now, particularly with more batteries, uh, that you can have a, uh, a system, uh, at least in California anyways, and I assume that the same is true in Hawaii, that you can have a rooftop system as long as it's connected in the right way to be able to island itself um, and, and you would be able to use that. You know, one of the things that uh, has happened in New Orleans um, is that people have uh, brought in um, generator systems, generator sets, uh, running fossil fuel mm -hmm. into their homes in order to generate power for all those things I mentioned, you know, right down to your electric toothbrush, you know? And, um, and the and and this uh, these generator sets have have have, uh, have exhausts, and the exhaust has uh, noxious, uh, toxic fuel uh, fumes, mm. and so they have actually died from the fumes mm. uh, of these generator sets being used indoors. Mm. So there's a certain danger in in doing the generator sets, but it also strikes me that if you have uh, solar panels on your roof, uh, whether or not you're connected to the grid, and for this discussion, we'll assume you're not connected to the grid, and those solar panels are feeding the rest of your house, except that, you know, the wiring was damaged, the panels, the system was damaged, and you're in the house, and it's feeding, you know, electricity into the house, and it's broken, there's the danger there too, isn't there? I would guess you are right. Yes, without being an electrician, I cannot confirm with full certainty, but yeah, I guess that probably would create a dangerous situation in some cases. Have to be able to turn it off. Anyway, okay, so the rest of my question or the viewer's question is what is the value economically of resilience to mm -hmm. you and to the community? This mm -hmm. is a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. And what is the cost? of that resilience to you or to the utility or to the community. And I suppose that all that means is who enjoys the, the value of the resilience and who pays the cost? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's an answer that the energy industry, I, I think there's not one answer to the value of resilience, but there's a, there's a way that the energy industry uh, tries to monetize to account for the monetary value of resilience. But uh, Jay, I might flip this on you for a moment. How much do you think, let's say you were expecting in the future for one power outage that would last a full day every year, how much uh, would you be willing to pay extra to Hawaiian Electric? if you got to keep power during that full day, that will just happen once a year. Okay, that's me now. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. am not particularly disadvantaged, although my wife thinks I am. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I would pay whatever the freight was. I would pay whatever it was. I believe in resilience. I believe in survival, mm -hmm. not only for me and my family, but also for the community. So I would pay whatever, whatever it costs, whatever, you know, the actual cost was, I would pay that. And if the utility calculated it at X dollars, I'd, I'd be happy to pay that. However, mm -hmm. I would like to add, you know, pursuant to the title of our show, there are some people that can't afford that. Mm -hmm. And they may make a much closer analysis of it. You know, you want a hundred dollars from me uh, for resilience for one day. I can't afford that. I'm out of work, you know, COVID has busted my budget. Um, I'm in terrible shape. 
I, I'm not even paying my electric bill now, much less then. Uh, so um, it would be a different answer for different demographic uh, uh, groups, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think, um, uh, and and uh, also different groups and how they how necessary electricity is to them on a daily basis. I think when you're talking about Texas during a winter storm, a lot of the attributable deaths in Texas were uh, hypothermia related. And so if you don't have electricity, um, uh, that that means something more dire than than hypothermia related deaths here in Hawaii, um, uh, in the Central Valley in California, which I have lived for a, a couple of years there when I lost power for three hours at the hottest time of the day, I was 105. And it was time time to have the AC on. Uh, I was very uncomfortable. Um, and I think uh, others would be in an even more um, uncomfortable situation if they were dependent upon that, if they were elderly, if they had medical devices. Um, so the, uh, I was reading a study earlier today about the value of lost load. The VOLL is an uh, uh, acronym in the energy industry. Um, and it varies from a dollar per kilowatt hour, which a kilowatt hour is a unit of electricity. We typically use about three to 500 uh, of those units in a month here in Hawaii um, in a household. So a dollar per kilowatt hour to $300 per kilowatt hour, depending on what you're using that electricity for. If you're a hospital, you're on the other end of the spectrum. If you're Allie, who's kind of uncomfortable and sweaty in her apartment in Fresno for three hours, you're probably on the $1 end of the spectrum. Um, uh, and, and having the resources to be able to adapt to a uh, loss of electricity, just like you mentioned before, that you can, you can leave town uh, I think there was a senator who got uh, criticized in the Texas ice storm for heading off on a semi-tropical vacation in oh, the middle of the Ted ice Cruz. storm. Everybody I knows Ted. <laughs> he's, a, he's a friend of a friend of the country mm -hmm. uh, in his mm -hmm. own strange way. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the country meaning Mexico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I Let think, me make a uh, distinction for you, Alex. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, you know, you mentioned, I think it's really important that that um, renewables, uh, specifically solar, uh, are renewable, are um, resilient because they don't require um, outside, outside help, outside fuel and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not necessarily the test of resilience mm -hmm. because you could have a fossil fuel. I mean, I think this would be clear for the analysis. You can have a fossil fuel system, uh, one of those generator sets that's been running for longer than I have, which is really a long time. Um, you can have that running on fossil fuel, and you have to you have to be resilient with that too. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, renewables do not solve the problem completely. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the problem with the old-fashioned renewables with fossil fuel is if I have a generator set. Um, that's um, you know old uh, and it breaks. I have to, I have engineering issues. Mm -hmm. um, I have to find an engineer who was around when it was designed. I may have to go to long distances to find replacement parts, and that's not resiliency at all. That's the opposite of resiliency. If, for example, this generator set was made in in Germany or somewhere in Europe, Scandinavia, what have you, we know they do manufacture, they have manufactured this equipment. It means I have to call a right um, and get them to ship that air freight, hopefully. And if it's a big, heavy piece of equipment, it's not gonna be air freight. Uh, so I can, I can start up that generator again. That's not resiliency, is it? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think the parts are a really good point, as well as the, the labor. I think um, having local individuals who are knowledgeable about uh, operating, maintaining, uh, problem solving our renewables is super important. And local workforce development is another reason for that. Uh, I mean, a, another component of that. I think the, the group that 
uh, has come on to the show before that I work with on Molokai, the whole Ahu Energy Cooperative Molokai. That's a huge effort of theirs is we're not just going to build this with outside labor and maintain it with outside labor, both because we want local economic development and we want our community to know how to uh, repair, maintain um, uh, in moments of crisis and in moments of not crisis. I think that makes us resilient as well if we are all not maybe not all of us need to be knowledgeable but we need to have people among us who who know what's going on well let's talk about uh, justice for a moment so suppose it cost me x dollars to be resilient uh, whatever system i'm using however i'm connecting or not whether i'm using for example community solar uh, whether i'm using um, you know fossil fuel generators uh, it's going to cost some money now, what is the equitable um, allocation of that cost? It's really important, especially in a time when people are economically stressed in our community and they don't have money. And um, how are you going to how are you going to raise that sum? It could be expensive, and maybe it should be expensive. It should be, you know, what is what does President Biden say? Build back better. Don't don't just have resilience um, to achieve what you already have. Have resilience to achieve better than what you already have. Um, so my question is, who pays the freight? How do you allocate that in accordance with, may I say, energy justice? I think that uh, it's an amazing question. And I think that our, <laughs> I'm gonna just solve it for us real quick in the next uh, seven minutes that we have. Um, uh, I'm not gonna do that, uh, but I, I believe that the reasons that are some of our low income communities and communities of color are more vulnerable are due to systematic oppression. And so just giving everybody $100 across the board per household to make yourself more resilient is not going to create an equitable situation. Uh, it's going to perpetuate the inequities that have led us to uh, some neighborhoods being more vulnerable to outages than others because of the resources that uh, the utility has prioritized to keep the lights on for the hospital in this neighborhood versus uh, the, the just purely residential over here. Um, so I, I personally believe that the system as a whole, that the that the, the rate payers as a whole need to pay for the resilience that brings us all um, to the same vulnerability. And hopefully that's the same resilience, not the same vulnerability, because that's taking a negative tone on it. But um, I believe that electricity is, is a human right and access to that um, uh, should be equitable, um, equal access. Uh, so, so how do you raise the money? Do you, do you include it in the rates that people pay? Mm. Some of them aren't paying any rates. They're, you know, they're not able. Um, mm. And do you include it? Do you include it in the uh, um, somehow you make the utility company pay out of their funds? Uh, um, do you make the state pay? Mm. Um, do you spread it among the taxpayers, the rate payers or the utility? Where are you going to get the money to build back better? Wow. Okay. All right. I think I can answer that. Um, I think that uh, the rate payers, the, the, the people who have chosen to be on the grid system, on, on our shared system and share in um, uh, those resources, I think that uh, recovering those costs across all of our rate payers um, makes sense and and keeping as you mentioned you know some folks uh, have assistance on their utility bills from federal subsidies and and I believe that those should stay in place because I think again those are addressing systematic inequities so uh, we shouldn't take those out so that everybody pays their fair share of resilience but I think um, uh, I support those systems staying in place as well as uh, these these extra costs that we are going to incur over the next several years um, will hopefully pay off. Like they're they're going to cost us money now, but uh, as PG&E's um, uh, CEO was arguing when they um, were arguing for, I think it was fifteen billion dollars worth of uh, transmission cost upgrades to bring their tr transmission lines underground. They said it's a huge cost now. 
but we're going to save money in the long run because we're going to cut out the risk of wildfires and the loss of property and life as a result of that. So um, I think if we share the cost now, we will share in the benefits later. That's the takeaway. That is so important. What you just said, that is really, that is also going to be on the final exam. Okay. Um, the other, <laughs> The other thing is uh, is the is the essential question, the title question we we need to answer, I think, in greater detail, and that is, um, you know, how resilient is Hawaii right now? Remember that Hawaii is, uh, you know, twenty five hundred miles away from the mainland. Uh, it's not clear that anybody's going to come and save us uh, or repair our equipment, um, or refurbish our, you know, um, <clears throat> broken equipment. Um, nobody's going to come from from Asia. Uh, we may or may not have the, uh, the the workforce or the equip or spare parts. We probably don't uh, in order to repair everything. Uh, and and looking at uh, the footage that came out of New Orleans, those towers fall down. The wind blows them right over. And you know it's not like we have a a storehouse of new towers that we can replace. We <clears throat> have to bring them in. We have to uh, build them and so forth. And, um, and we have towers in Hawaii that would fall over in extreme weather, for sure. We also have the telephone poles in so many neighborhoods, including my neighborhood, where you know it's for sure they would fall over and somebody's got to build them back. So <clears throat> the, the issue in, in uh, New Orleans uh, was why didn't, we, why didn't we bury these lines a long time ago? And the same issue exists here. Why didn't we bury these lines a long time ago? We would be so much more resilient if we had done that. Can we do it now? Um, it's not going to be cheap in, in, in any way, including legally, uh, to bury them. Um, so query, how resilient are we now, Ali? This is not an easy question. And maybe the answer is not very either. Mm -hmm. Ooh, OK. Um... I think that's a question that I'm not very well equipped to answer just because there are lots of uncertainties in that. Um, uh, what I do know is that uh, I learned that about uh, the 3000 miles of uh, Hawaiian Electric owned distribution and transmission lines across uh, the Hawaiian Electric territory, I did not look up KAUC, about 40% of those lines are underground already. Uh, so underground lines uh, tend to be more resilient, although they do have their own risks to people digging them up when they're building new things or uh, planting a really deep garden. Um, uh, and they, they're more prone to potential water damage because they're under the ground there, which is another vulnerability that we have with sea level rise. Um, and I, I know that uh, in new development, uh, there's a policy around uh, underground lines. Um, if a new development, I think it's over four units uh, gets built, then they go underground. So there's a movement generally towards undergrounding, but I think uh, it's something like a million dollars a mile, or maybe it's three quarters of a million dollars a mile, somewhere around there. Um, uh, for undergrounding, for, for building a new underground um, uh, distribution line. So uh, that's, multiply that by 60% of 3,000 lines, I could get out my calculator, but that's, that's a pretty penny. Yeah, one thing strikes me from what you said with the 60, 40% and all that is the weakest link is the one that determines resiliency. Um, if I if I have one part of the system that's um, not underground and it, and it feeds the part that's underground um, and a storm comes, the whole thing is going to go down. Um, so it's you know it's um, you gotta you gotta put it all underground. Ultimately, that's better resiliency. I agree with you that maybe it's subject to water, but that can be that can be dealt with. I think wind is a more serious problem for extreme weather here in Hawaii. Um, but but let me let me we don't have a lot of time left and I want to ask you a, a com another compound question okay? um, <clears throat> you know it's it's out of um, Charles Dickens and the, the Christmas Carol it's looking at uh, Christmas uh, future with Ebenezer Scrooge if you remember and and I don't 
mean to refer to his willingness to spend money, by the way. Um, so what is your warning to all of us about the dark side of the future? If we do nothing to enhance our resilience, if we do nothing for whatever reason it might be to um, you know, make our systems more resilient. And the second part of that question is, if we were to do something to meet that, that warning, that admonition, that dark side out of, out of Charles Dickens, uh, what would we do? What step would we put out first? What, what, would, the, what would the action point be? Ooh, um, okay. Uh, what are the first part of the question was sort of the, the pessimistic, what's going to happen? What, uh, what are we in for if we do nothing? Um, and I, I think that's a scary thing to think about, but uh, we've, we've probably seen a, um, uh, some flashes of what's to come flashes, maybe flash flooding, flash um, uh, storms. Um, I think that uh, what is happening in New Orleans right now with over 400,000 people still being without power, um, I think we could see a very real scenario like that in Hawaii um, weeks after a storm uh, if we do not address um, the infrastructure issues. Um, I'm not much of a doomsdayer, so I'm going to focus on the second part of your question, uh, which is more about what should we do uh, to address that. Um, I think that the most powerful way to make our communities more resilient is to tap into the knowledge of what our communities already know about what risks and vulnerabilities they are there are. I think uh, I have learned so much from working with uh, the Moloka'i community about uh, where good places and bad places to develop are, what is vulnerable, what areas are vulnerable to flooding and not, at what times of year. I think I think, and I've only just scratched the surface of that. Uh, discussion. I think that there's a lot to learn, and there are already communities that are taking steps towards that. I learned about an awesome resiliency hub in Haula that is being um, uh, spearheaded by a community group to create a resilient hub um, that can serve as um, a kind of a, a multi-use uh, shelter in the case of um, bad weather. They, that's an awesome project. I think more projects like that where we use local knowledge, we, we build up local capacity um, uh, to know and maintain and repair and uh, construct. Um, I think that's where we're going to be resilient both to outages and, and from a social and economic perspective. I think that's how we become resilient. You know, a lot of uh, the best laid plans of mice and men and women uh, in Hawaii get put on the shelf and we do a great job at talking it up and then we don't do action. Uh, and, and that's you know deeply ingrained in our DNA and our culture here, I'm sorry to say. And uh, this is a time in climate change when we really can't afford to be like that. So to my last question to you, Ali, um, <clears throat> to what extent um, do the experiences in Texas uh, and in New Orleans to what extent are they wake up calls or should they be wake up calls for us, the consumers, for the utility, for the legislature, for the governor? To what extent should we be concerned and treat that as a wake up call uh, to get on it and develop action points? Um, I think to a huge extent that's a wake up call and I, I think that is something that uh, seeing the devastation that has happened, the loss of life, the loss of property, um, uh, the pandemonium, um, I think that uh, that is that is certainly something that that can and 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 well, I won't say will, but it it could happen here for for sure. And I do think that it's a huge wake up call, and I think it's something that our frontline communities have been aware of for a long time. And I think it it's a uh, that vulnerability, that um, uh, sense of we need to be resilient for ourselves, um, uh, that I think we need to heed, heed their voices and their call in this as well, uh, take their lead. 
Um, and yeah, I think you're exactly right. Uh, it should be a call to action for all of our people in power who can help make a difference, direct resources and direct policies to uh, booster, bolster, bolster our resilience. Alejandra's an energy nerd, energy follower, energy justice person, community person. Thank you so much. Uh, for for having this discussion with me, and I'm looking forward to your next show two weeks from now. Ali Andrews, thank you very much. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks, Jane.